Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Ethics Roundtable on Teaching Heritage Management Ethics. Those of you that may not know me, I'm the director of the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program at the UCCS College of Business and a professor at the College of Business and Marketing and International Business. I'm Tracy Gonzalez Padron, and we are so excited to hear from our Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Fellow, Karen Larkin. Karen is an assistant professor in anthropology and in of the College of Letters and Arts and Sciences. And we are looking forward to hearing about a new class that she will be developing on uh, heritage management, ethics, and law. Well, thank you. And thank you all of you who showed up at nine o'clock this morning to listen to me talk about new class I'm developing. Um, I want to focus today on how I can incorporate ethics into teaching about heritage management. And when I say ethics, I want to be clear that I mean I want to teach both ethical decision making as well as our disciplinary ethics um, to better prepare our students to enter the job force. Now, my area of focus uh, is related to heritage management, and that includes archaeology and museum studies. As an archaeologist and museum professional, my work involves interpreting, excavating, preserving a people's culture. I train students to work in industries that involve making decisions, uh, which impact cultural heritage and its management. So today, what I plan to do is to explain a little bit about what cultural heritage management is, for those of you who don't know, um, why ethics matter in heritage management. And then I'll also teach about why, or talk about why I'm teaching heritage management and how I can include ethics um, as I just sort of define them in my teaching. Then I'm gonna share a couple of class activities that I've created um, that uh, teach both the disciplinary ethics as well as ethical decision-making. And I'm hoping that in sharing these, I can solicit input and feedback on how I can improve these activities before I employ them in a new class that I am teaching this fall. So what is cultural heritage management? Cultural heritage management is a multi-billion dollar industry here in the United States that encompasses both museum work and what we call cultural resources management. So cultural resources management is an industry specific term that refers to a vocation that involves um, ensuring compliance with state, uh, local and federal laws uh, that mandate that we evaluate the impacts on our cultural resources that um, you, that involve projects with local, state, and federal funding. So these resources can include archaeological sites, historical sites, architecture, museums, uh, cultural landscapes, to name just a few. And these cultural resources are generally under threat from a variety of activities like development and construction activities, including urban development, large-scale agriculture, mining activity, but also activities and forces like looting, erosion, natural disasters, um, like the fires that we've recently had, or even unsustainable visitor numbers and habits. So this industry arose out of a series of heritage protection legislation um, at local, state, and uh, federal levels, primarily beginning in the 1960s. So many of these laws also govern museum activities, as well as local, state, and federal lands, parks, buildings, and heritage sites. The industry comprises both public and private institutions, ranging from for-profit organizations, private nonprofit organizations like museums, um, and resources managed by um, local, state, and federal governmental agencies. Some of these heritage sites um, in Colorado that you might be familiar with include places like Garden of the Gods Park, uh, Mesa Verde National Park, the Bureau of Land Management, uh, National Forest Lands, uh, many museums throughout the state, but also UCCS because it is a state uh, institution. 
So why are ethics important in heritage management? Cultural resource management professionals make evaluations on whether to preserve cultural resources based on whether we deem those resources significant. And significance is defined under the laws um, that were passed at federal and state levels and generally relate to whether or not they are eligible for national, local, or state registers of historic places. Um, so we identify ways to mitigate impacts from potential harm um, and how we can manage these resources. So while there are federal, local, state laws that govern heritage management, there's also serious ethical considerations. Um, nationally and internationally, codes of ethics have been developed and grown out of uh, treaties, but also past missteps um, and collaborations with stakeholders and in dialogue with these various laws. So because the decisions that professionals in the industry make impact people's history, their objects, their identity, access to their land, access to resources and cultural information, adhering to ethics is imperative. The foundational principles that are outlined in the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative can help some of these budding professionals that I'm trying to train with, decision, with um, ethical decision-making. So why are we even teaching heritage management at UCCS? Many of our anthropology programs actually across the United States don't bother teaching this. So why are we doing this here? In the spring of 2020, the Department of Anthropology la launched a new Bachelor of Innovation degree in Museum Practice and Heritage Management. And this is housed in anthropology. And this degree is designed to uh, train students to enter into these cultural heritage management industries, including CRM and museums, but also you know, BLM or Forest Service. So as part of my fellowship, my project focuses on developing curriculum that can help foster uh, ethical thinking and decision-making related to this profession. Um, but it's also as part of a required class for the degree called Archaeology and Public Policy. This class has been taught before. Um, it introduces students to the laws um, of, of uh, heritage resources, heritage management, but we're expanding this class. Previously, this class was taught by a um, heritage management professional, works for the Forest Service, but it was taught as a spring break class. So it was extremely condensed. And because we've um, developed this new program, Bachelor of Innovation program, we want to expand this class um, into a full semester. So in doing that, I am planning to teach this class next fall. And so I've been working on um, how I can sort of add additional uh, information into the class to create it into a full semester, but also how I can incorporate ethics into the class because currently those aren't part of the way the class is taught. So I've developed um, and adapted a couple of different activities um, that I wanna share with you guys today. And I'm hoping to solicit feedback. So I'm gonna share these and I'm hoping you all will look them over and give me some ideas on how I can improve them or change them. Or if you have better ideas, I'm open to those as well. The two activities that I'm gonna share sort of fit under this category of high impact teaching practices. And I believe that these would be very helpful for students um, understanding both the content but also the application um, of ethical, of the codes of ethics, but also ethical behavior and decision-making in the industry um, and how these ethics intersect with the heritage laws. So the first is a role-playing scenario that I've developed. Um, and this is designed to encourage students to develop a transparent process that allows all the various stakeholders that participate in decision-making um, related to how resources, these cultural resources are gonna be handled in the face of, um, of development or construction. So this, um, 
This asks students to take on roles of stakeholders and participate in the decision-making process within those stakeholder roles. Um, and it gives them a scenario that forces them to sort of consider making these decisions at this intersection of preservation and development. Um, so this activity is called the Stadium Showdown, and I'll share that with you in a moment. And then the second um, set of activities that I've put together involve a set of case study scenarios that students must critically evaluate according to applicable heritage law and also ethical standards um, of the industry. The scenarios require students to understand both the letter and the spirit of the laws so that they can discuss um, these in relation to industry ethics and devise viable solutions to comply with the intent of the regulation while also maintaining the ethical principles. These types of activities, I believe, encourage empathy, creativity, problem solving, compromise, accountability, respect, transparency. Um, many of these are part of the uh, Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative principle, founding principles. So my plan for the course, the class itself, is to spend the first sort of half of the class teaching students about the federal, state, international laws that govern heritage management. Then I plan on introducing the disciplinary um, codes of ethics, and we have several um, in anthropology. And I'm just gonna share one of those with you today. Uh, and then we're gonna look at, uh, together as a class, we're going to sort of dissect and analyze a couple of really important case studies. And those involve um, things uh, that uh, happened previously in construction, um, federal construction. Um, one of the case studies I plan on looking at is called the African Burial Grounds. Um, which is a, a burial ground that was discovered in New York City, right, a lot, right near Wall Street, actually, um, while they were in the process of constructing a new federal building for the General Services Administration. And this happened in the 1990s. You guys might be maybe be familiar with it. Um, in, in building that building, they identified uh, an area that had in the 16, late 16, early 1700s had been um, a African burial ground. So a burial ground for slaves, people who had been brought over from Africa um, and enslaved. They were buried there. There had been a ton of construction, so they didn't really expect to find anything there. But uh, lo and behold, because it was actually in a depression and that depression had been filled in, there was a significant portion of um, that burial ground that had been preserved. Um, so it was an unexpected find and it caused quite a controversy um, in how the General Services Administration was planning on handling that. So we would um, sort of study the case studies like that, discuss sort of what happened. There's um, great resources out there to talk about that one discuss those as a class in terms of the applicable laws as well as the ethics. Um, and then after we've sort of shared um, as a class, dissecting some of these, what I'd like to do then is introduce in the sort of last third of the class, introduce these two activities um, and have them apply some of this knowledge um, that they're learning. So I'm gonna share these Hopefully, I'm going to share these with you. Um, I would like to uh, put some of them in the chat, but I will also bring them up. So the stadium showdown, um, I'm going to share uh, three things in the chat with you. If you are not familiar with the uh, Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative uh, principles, uh, I have that document that I'd like to share with you, uh, as well as the sort of instructor guide for the this role playing activity, and then the student instructions for the role playing activity. 
So I'm going to share all those three um, in the chat with you in just a minute. But just to give you a little background, this activity would start with a discussion of these Daniel Fawn Ethics Initiative principles. So I would ask students to discuss the importance of these prior to beginning the activity um, and how they might apply to these sort of controversial situations like the one I just described, as well as the one that they are going to be um, engaged in in the activity. And then uh, they will do the activity um, as outlined in these instructions that I've, uh, I'll provide to you. Uh, and then finally, at the end, they write a reflection um, paper that has them uh, consider uh, the process and how these uh, ethical principles um, were utilized or not um, during the, the sort of role-playing activity. Um, so you'll see all those in the prompt. The second uh, sort of activity that I'm gonna share is the case study scenarios. Um, so I also want students to become really familiar with applying our disciplinary ethics um, to very specific case studies. These case studies um, I've sort of adapted and pulled from a variety of different sources. Um, and some of those involve ethics bowls at various um, conferences that, that we've, I've attended. And so these case studies um, ask students to both identify the relevant laws um, to the scenario that they're reading, as well as um, the applicable ethics within a specific code of ethics that I'm going to share. So I will share all that information with you with the instruction instructions. And then what I'm hoping is that I'll, you know, first show the stadium showdown and get some input from y'all. Uh, and then I would like to share the um, case studies which right now I have as a case studies, but just keep in mind that these could also be run as an ethics bowl um, in the class. So these are designed to work either way. So I am going to now hopefully bring up the stadium showdown. Make sure I have the right document. All right, so the first one I'm sharing, I'm hoping you're seeing it on the screen. If you're not, somebody please speak up and let me know. And I'm going to attempt to share a link with you in the chat. I'm hoping you can access that. So the first link I'm putting in is the instructor's guide um, to the stadium showdown. The second link I'm putting in is the Daniels is a uh, the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative document that lists their sort of eight founding principles, and the third is then the student's guide, the student's instruction. Okay. So can somebody just give me maybe even just a little thumbs up to let me know that those documents are available to you in the chat? Thank you. Um, and that you can see them on the screen as well. I can see most of your screen, maybe scrolling down just a little bit. Yes. Um, and then we would see maybe the whole picture of the stadium. So I will have to scroll down. I wanted to make it big enough that you could read the documents on the screen, which is why you only can see half part of the page. Um, so first I wanna start 
you know, I would begin, thank you, by the way, for, for giving me that feedback. Um, the first thing I would do is um, go through these uh, principles for the Daniels Fund Ethic, Ethics Initiative. And I know many of you are probably familiar with these, um, but just to, um, you know, for those of you who aren't, there are uh, this set of principles, integrity, trust, accountability, transparency, fairness, respect, rule of law, and viability. Um, and so my um, sort of goal would be to have a discussion about how these um, principles would relate to scenarios like I described to you for the, um, briefly described to you for the African burial grounds, but also for the, this activity that's coming up for the stadium showdown. Um, so go through, talk about what these mean, um, how these would apply to heritage management generally, and then have the students keep these in mind as they're working through this activity. So the activity itself, um, I have sort of two different documents. The first one is for the instructors that go through, this is just the cover page. Um, and it gives a background information um, on a role-playing scenario. So in this scenario, it's called a stadium showdown and it's to dig or not to dig. So in this case, the city of Denver has acquired land um, to construct a new football stadium. Now I know we have a new football stadium, but pretend we don't. Um, pretend they're building the, gosh, I don't even know what it's called now, Mile High, whatever at Mile High um, Stadium that will house um, this, uh, the football franchise. The new facility is going to require a construction of highway extension and an interchange um, to connect it to the, um, uh, to interstate, but also to Denver's light rail system. And because there's going to be federal funds involved with the highway construction, um, then it must, this project has to undergo um, an archeological survey to determine whether or not any cultural resources are going to be impacted. So according to our heritage management laws, anytime there is a state or federal, what we call nexus, so sort of funding involved, it has to, they have to adhere to these federal laws, including the National Historic Preservation Act, um, as well as the oh, NEPA, National Environmental Protection, I forget what NEPA is, um, <laughs> the, all of the acronyms. So, which involves doing archeological survey, identifying um, whether or not there are significant resources that are going to be impacted um, and how those can be coming up with ways that those can be mitigated, those impacts can be mitigated. So after several weeks of intense field site testing, archeologists report that the site actually is of tremendous scientific and historical value and could help answer many questions concerning Denver and Colorado's um, indigenous past. So the archeologists report that they have in fact uncovered an extensive concentration of human remains deposited in numerous large ossuaries, so um, burials. These remains have been identified by forensic anthropologists as being Native American and um, archaeologists in compliance with the federal and state preservation laws have to halt further excavation um, and construction, notify the Native American Tribal Council um, at the Colorado Commission of Indian Affairs, as well as the State Historic Preservation Office. Tribal leaders um, are then consulted, and so they are asked to visit the excavation site. Um, and they identify that um, many of the artifacts are, in fact, ancient ceremonial and burial objects, which means that the Native American Graves Protection and pa Repatriation Act kicks in. Um, and so then they have to. Uh, go through a process of consultation um, and fitting, figuring out how to mitigate this site. So of course, this sends shockwaves through the Denver community um, who is 
been looking forward to their new stadium. The governor gets involved, the mayor gets involved, city council gets involved. Um, and so the, um, they, are, they ask that they form a task force that is charged with making recommendations um, on how to deal with the situation. So the task force involves the people that I've listed here. Um, you can see the Stadium Building Authority, the State Archaeologist, Denver Convention and Visitors Bureau, Landmark Preservation Commission, the Native American Tribal Council, Irving Planning Commission, um, Colorado Archaeological Society, the Denver Historical Society, the owner of a franchise, the Broncos Fan Cup, the Hotel Owners Association, the Denver Economic uh, Development, um, RTD, uh, because of the light rail. Uh, there's a professor of archaeology that's asked to join the task force, uh, the Institute for in, uh, Indigenous Resource Management representative, the Native American Rights Fund, and the Small Business Association. So these are the stakeholders involved in the task force. In addition, the mayor is asked to serve as the chairperson, and the president of the city council, who does have Native American ancestry, will serve as the vice chairperson. So this is the task force, and these are the stakeholder roles that the students would be asked to take on. And I have um, a basically the lesson objectives and an overview um, of what they need to be doing. And I'm just going to scroll down to sort of the actual instructions. So for the instructor, you would introduce, you know, sort of this as I've just done to you um, and establish um, sort of the process for how the discussion is going to happen. And I, I do, and I didn't share this with you, but I do have uh, sort of an outline of the steps that students would take. And um, I, I, can, I can pull that up and share that in the chat in a moment as well. Then I assign students. So I do not let them choose their stakeholders um, roles within this scenario. I assign them and usually I assign them randomly. Um, and uh, I have students that have similar sort of group opinions work together. So depending on the class size, you know, I can sort of scale it up or scale it back, um, have more people within each of these stakeholder groups or fewer. I have um, each group construct sort of a um, organization um, to list all of the main points that they want to make um, in these task force meetings. Then the students engage um, in these discussions within the task force meetings according to their stakeholder roles. Then they're encouraged and they're so they're encouraged to sort of examine the laws as well as the ethics in deciding um, sort of how they're going to present their position um, and make arguments within their position. So then at the end, um, I also have them write up a reflection to debrief um, on these issues that were presented, um, the process, the negotiations that happened during the activity. Um, and talk about sort of the relevant laws and codes of ethics. Um, they can also offer their own personal opinions, but they have to be clear to distinguish those um, from those of the uh, sort of disciplinary ethics. So, and then these are the sort of, um, uh, I don't know, roll cards <laughs> um, that you get. So the stadium building authority, they're, viewpoint is you support the building and the stadium is planned. So it gives them sort of what their position is according to their stakeholder roles. Now the students see something very similar to this, so, you know, each of these. And, and those are designed so that, it, you know, we're supposed to have kind of a balance um, between, you know, people who want the building construction to happen and people who want to preserve the archeological site um, and interpret the archaeological site. Um, so for instance, the state archaeologist is in kind of an, a sticky situation because um, they are a state employee and they're appointed by the governor. Um, they live there in the city, but ethically, they also need to support the preservation um, of the site and the materials. Um, 
So for instance, the um, uh, Denver Landmark Preservation Commission, they're opposed to the construction um, of the, at the site um, and uh, they want to construct an outdoor preservation park there instead. Um, so you, you get kind of an idea of um, sort of what some of those roles might be. And you can always scroll through them in the links that I've sent you as well. The students get something very similar. Um, they get sort of the overview that I gave you, what all the roles are. Then they have the procedures from a student perspective. So this is what they have to do. They have to read all the background information. They have to identify their stakeholders. Um, they all get together as a group. They engage in the discussions. Um, then they uh, sort of hear everybody's proposed, each stakeholder group's proposed solutions to this problem. Then they get back together in their stakeholder um, groups and they sort of decide what kind of concessions they want to make, if any, um, and uh, start negotiating sort of with other stakeholders, maybe forming coalitions or negotiating with those of opposing views. Then they come back together in the task force discussions, present what they've come up with to the mayor and the president of the city council. And then of course they do the reflection piece at the end. So this is the first activity and I would love to hear some feedback or suggestions on um, you know, how I might change this or, or make it better or should I just ditch it? Well, Karen, I think I can confidently agree with everybody else when I say don't ditch it. This looks really cool. Um, I really appreciate that you have so many different stakeholders represented in this conversation. I think sometimes it's easy for us to think of that as like money versus history and just leave it at that. So I really like that you've taken the time to like really thoroughly explain these different stakeholders, that there's so many of them, that they each have their own like motivations and incentives coming into this conversation. I would be curious, and if this is already in here and I just kind of missed it, then you can kind of dismiss this comment. Just kind of a reminder to students going through this to think about like the generational consequences of this decision. It's not just making a decision for like today's Denver, it's making a decision that could potentially impact generations worth of Coloradoans thinking about the difference between like the economic value of the stadium generationally versus the uh, historic relevance and significance of that site for generations to come. So reminding them that this isn't just a discussion or decision that impacts modern Denver, but that this is something that will have consequences moving forward. Yeah, that's a great point. And I appreciate that. I definitely want to build that in. Uh, also, there was a question in the chat, um, how much time would be dedicated? So I've run similar types of role play activities like this. Um, generally, what I do is run it over. So I usually do sort of the double block, so the three hour periods. I usually run it over uh, two to three class periods, give them time to um, sort of get familiar with it. Um, but also have time, you know, get familiar with the, the case scenario, their roles, everything, um, and the other stakeholders' positions, but also give them time in between to reflect on that um, before coming back and um, trying to resume those task force discussions. So giving a bit of negotiation or reflection period in between. There's also a comment in here about the realistic roles. So, I mean, one of the things I'm trying to get across is that this is not like black and white. This isn't sort of cut and dry and that there are a lot of things that need to be taken into consideration when we're making these decisions, which much more accurately reflects um, what's gonna happen for these students when they get out into their professional roles, um, actually trying to practice. Um, the you know um, heritage management, which is tough. You know, there's not always a sort of black and white answer, and that you need to be able to think through all of this nuance. 
other questions, comments, suggestions? I'm super open. <laughs> Hey, Karen, I was going to put this in the chat, but I guess I'll just mention it now. This is Christina. Um, I'm wondering if, because I, I don't recall you saying it, if you have the students like shift roles um, during it. So they actually get, you know, they kind of have to put on and really engage with multiple perspectives as uh, kind of owning that perspective. So I... And that's great. So I've run some similar types of things like this, um, not this particular one, but role playing activities and the students get really invested in their roles like they are leaving class still arguing their, you know, role their stakeholder position, <laughs> um, even if they didn't initially agree with it. Um, and so I haven't built that in, but one of the sort of ag additional activities that I thought people could do um, is afterwards, if you if you see here in the um, additional activities number six, the second one is to have students then after the fact adopt an opposition viewpoint and write like an editorial. So instead of having go through this process all over again or shift roles halfway through, have them then do sort of a writing activity at the end where they do have to um, adopt the opposition view. Yeah, actually, I think that's a great idea, doing a kind of a self-reflective in the opposite, Yeah, because it might just take too much time in the class as well to have them adopt a whole nother role. But well, that's what I worry about. Yeah. I mean, it already yeah. takes a bit of time, so. <laughs> right. It's great, though. Any other suggestions? These are all great. This is this is Judith. Um, I, unfortunately, I can't remember her name in, in psych, the, the person who did a lot of studies on jury behavior. And she did an exercise with her class, which I'm not sure as a student I would have liked, but it was interesting, is they had a lot of debates. And she gave a score to the team um, because she wanted the teams to work together and see both sides. So if one side, the pro or the con side, turned out to have done a ton of research and was really well prepared and the other side was not, they would have gotten you know, a C or something because she wanted to make sure that they shared those viewpoints. Again, I, I said from the student perspective, I thought I wouldn't like this, but she thought it was really effective. I will, I will look, remember her name and I'll email it to you. Um, Christina Jimenez put in the chat that it was Eddie Green? Edie, Edie, Edie Green. Edie Green. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good, so, you know, that is a great suggestion. One of the other things that I usually do when I do group activities, and I did not provide this or mention this before, um, is I actually have them score, like do peer evaluations um, for how, you know, their groups worked together. Um, so, you know, I could build that certainly in at the end as well. I like having them grade each other because <laughs> then they, um, you know, are sort of accountable to each other, which is, which is how it would work out in the real world, right? Is you're accountable to this team that you're on um, and sharing information. So that's a great point. I wrote that down too. Anything else? You guys are so helpful. Yeah, I have... A quest. This is Carlos Duarte. Um, how do students? How do you prepare students to take on the role of a racialized identity for this exercise? And how do you manage people who actually have that identity during this exercise? So, part of um, what we do ahead of time is I, I have a. Um, sort of a, a worksheet that they work through um, that asks them to do research on this, um, on their roles um, prior to this. And I, I have it somewhere, I can share that with you as well. Um, so they have to go through and do research on the uh, sort of uh, stakeholder position um, that they have. So they have to go through and say, do, where's my, 
um, research on what are um, the tribes that would be represented in this area. Um, what are their so the the um, uh, Colorado Council. Um, what is it the 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 commission the Colorado Commission of Indian Affairs um, does have a list of all of the 47 tribes that are represented um, here in Colorado and there are um, representatives uh, that uh, are listed in those so you can reach out um, to those uh, tribal websites and they oftentimes on their um, on their uh, um, TIPO's office, which is the Tribal Historic Preservation Office, have some of these like viewpoints and stand um, that they post. So I have them do some research ahead of time on this. Um, but it's 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 a tough one um, for them to learn how to sort of empathize um, and understand other people's points of view. Um, but it's something that I think is important for them to try to learn how to do. Um, it's very difficult to, um, to teach that without immersing them in it, I think. But if you have better suggestions, I'm open to them. I have to think about that, but thank you. So I do have one other sort of activity that I want to share with you. It is not quite as in-depth or intense, so makes it a little easier. Um, the second activity that I use are these case study scenarios that we can run. I can run either, I've, I've done it where they just sort of work through them. Um, oops. Um, try to get to the make you all dizzy sorry about that um run through them but in this activity what i do is i give them we've already gone through all of the heritage management laws so they should know those before we do this activity i also provide them with a um copy of the register of professional archaeologists code of ethics or code of conduct um, and so this activity asks them to go through and, sorry, I'm trying to put this in the chat for you, to go through and read these various scenarios and tell me what the applicable laws and applicable codes, um, ethical codes that are the disciplinary codes relate to these scenarios. So I have like a series of scenarios here um, where they go through, and I'm gonna need to share that as well. Sorry. If only I could think and type at the same time or talk and type at the same time, my life would be so much easier. Um, where they go through, it gives them scenarios like the one that you see here, um, and then ask them to identify the um, laws that were violated. And then what are the ethical considerations according to the disciplinary code of conduct that I've shared with them? And the disciplinary code of conduct in this case um, actually has sort of two um, different components. There's um, sort of the, the code of conduct as a professional, but then there's also the, um, the research code of conduct. Um, and so I asked them to sort of make sure that they are addressing both of those when they're going through these scenarios. So I know we're almost out of time, um, but I just wanted to sort of share these resources and see if you guys had any other ideas or feedback or thoughts. Um, I'm super open to them. Um, you can share them with me now, um, or here's my email address as well, that you are welcome to um, send me feedback, comments, thoughts, anything. Um, the source for the code of conduct is the Register of Professional Archaeologists. 
um, which is a professional organization. <clears throat> Suzanne, did you have a question? Yeah, something that comes to mind for me teaching French um, is the whole issue of repatriation of, of uh, archaeological cultural items from French museums to like Benin and some other West uh, African nations. And just how I, I've read some really interesting articles about this and just how it's a little more complicated than it might seem like it might seem obvious that those things should be repatriated, but there's so many concerns. Um, is that something that that could fit into your course? So Suzanne, I actually adapted the stadium showdown from a role play activity that I have on repatriation um, for museums. So this was uh, the activity, the role play activity that I originally um, sort of run in class is on repatriating uh, human remains and funerary objects from an archeological site here in the United States to the tribes. And so it's very similar sort of setup, um, but it's very easy to adapt um, these role play activities to any of these sort of situations that are controversial or that have sort of these multiple stakeholders with opposing viewpoints um, involved. So yes, I have done this with the repatriation and you're right, it is very complicated um, in terms of um, the various laws that apply, especially when you go international, um, but also the, the viewpoints and the stakeholders involved because, because of issues on uh, around cultural heritage on um, sort of access and availability. Um, so it, it gets really complicated, but it looks like my time is up. So I will let Tracy take over and please let me know if you have any other questions. Oh, well, thank you so much, Karen. We really, really appreciated everything that you've presented and given so many ideas. I um, actually wanted to propose, you know, maybe we even did an event like this, a competition with a, an innovative uh, role play. I think it would be an enjoying uh, event. So our time is up and I wanna thank uh, Karen and all of the participants, the attendees. Uh, I think that everyone contributed and learned a lot. So uh, have a, a great rest of the day.